so I am Mike Milton, maybe not the man, but I'm Mike <laughs> Milton. I run StoryCode New York City, uh, which is a chapter of StoryCode, so thanks for coming. Welcome to the uh, May Forum. We're really excited to welcome the team from Wolf 359. We'll be talking about an awesome project called Temping. Did anyone, was anyone able to experience Temping at the Convergence Festival this past year? Raise your hands high. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Glenn, you are a very lucky person. Uh, I did, and it was awesome, and we're really excited to learn more about the project, what kind of uh, went into it, and hey, I'm, I'm all for any presentation that begins with some code on the screen. This is story code, anyway. Uh, so with, uh, with that, I will turn the mic over to the team, and uh, welcome, guys. Uh, hi everyone, thank you all so much for uh, inviting us here. Um, I'm Michael Brow, I am one of the co-founders of Wolf 359. Uh, Michael H. Carly, one of the other co-founders of Wolf 359, is right there in the front row. And he'll be here to answer questions with us at the end. But Asa, who is another member of Wolf 359, are going to talk um, about our project, Temping, since we were the ones who've been working on this one for the longest. Um, so, I, I thought we'd begin first with a little bit about what Wolf 359 is. Um, we started off as a theater company, um, and we uh, sort of have been gradually moving through different phases of our work over uh, the past couple of years. Uh, one of the first shows that we did, that Asa and I worked on together with Michael Yates Crowley, was a show called Evanston in like the top right corner, which was just a normal play, like people go and see. Um, and then our next <laughs> show uh, was called Righteous Money, um, which was our first sort of incorporation of technology. We started working with um, live video and cameras, and um, uh, the show was sort of a recreation of um, a financial advice show, uh, but live for an audience, sort of like, if Mad Money happened and Mad and like Jim Cramer had a breakdown um, mid show, and then our our sort of like piece that we made right before we made Temping um, was a piece called Song of a Convalescent Ayn Rand, giving thanks to the Godhead in the Libyan mode, where we took about three different um, sources of inspiration: a Beethoven quartet. Uh, the writings and uh, letters of Ayn Rand and medical literature on migraines and tried to like mush all of those things into a show. Um, and, uh, and then we made Temping. And uh, I think you can sort of say that uh, you can see the course of our work from Evanston to Righteous Money towards where we arrived at today with Temping as a uh, a progression where we've started moving away from straight up theater making and more towards experiences with technology or um, sort of looking at uh, how technology affects us in our lives. Um, and there, there was a joke that Crowley and I used to make with each other that we were not actually a theater company but that we were just a narrative technology startup. <laughs> and. Um, it became less and less of a joke <laughs> over time. So, uh, what is temping? Um, it's an office simulation, I think is like the, the simplest way to talk about it. Um, and for those of you, since only one person in the room was actually able to experience I'm gonna sort of describe what the show was. Um, and, and it took place, well, we'll, we'll get there. Um, this is what, this is, uh, for one person at a time. It's yes. a solo theatrical experience. I'm going to you, Asa. Uh, oh, and when somebody got here, they were met by a person and they were led uh, into a room uh, with no knowledge of what they were ex experience. And they go into the room and they sit down uh, at a cubicle oh. inside an office. And we sit them down and say, this is your desk and this is your phone. Go to work. Uh, and there's... Um, 
things on the wall that they can look at, and there's things for them to touch and play with and interact, and we even gave them snacks. And <laughs> once they explored all this, they look up at the desktop, and they have an inbox. And that inbox is full of emails addressed to them by name, asking them to do certain things. And over the next roughly 45 minutes, they experienced a story about the other people who worked in this office through voicemails and printouts and emails and a couple of other avenues of communication. But what was important to us is that this was a piece with no actors. Um, we were a theater company and we made shows with actors for many years. And uh, one of the sort of initial impulses that we had with the piece was, okay, no more actors. Let's see if we can do a piece without any kind of like live performers. And don't get me wrong, there were still characters in the piece, but you would never, we wanted you to never sort of like meet another human being. Um, and so that was one of the sort of first rules of the experience. And with that rule, we sort of began asking the question of like, okay, well, if, we're, if we don't have actors, how can we communicate with our audience? Um, and looking at the, the tools of a modern office, um, we sort of looked at, okay, well, you can email someone, you can uh, call them, you could send something to their printer, um, and then we sort of looked at it, like the built environment around that as a, another sort of storytelling experience, um, or ways in which you could understand more about the person whose desk you were sitting at through the built environment. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about how we arrived at this show. Um, so the, the beginning of it is that Asa and I got hired to do a piece of theater in Williamsburg and um, called David's Red Hair Death. And that show was maybe not the most satisfying artistic experience for the two of us, um, but we really liked working with each other. And it was in this weird, beautiful space that was, as you can tell, like hung for aerial work, so we had like aerialists and a sort of wraparound 3D projection system, or three walls of projection system, excuse me. Um, and what we were interested in is like, oh, you know what's really fun? Projections, and you know what's really cool? Sort of wrapping that experience around an audience. Um, and we started sitting, we started meeting at uh, the 96th Street Whole Foods and uh, at those big tables and kind of trying to figure out like, okay, what, what can we do with video projection systems? What can we do with four walls? What, what kind of stories could we tell that way? So we went through a whole bunch of different ideas and a whole lot of sort of conceptual sketches for things. And then we've tried to sort of lay stories on top of it and the stories got really weird. Everything from like, uh, we're trying to do a show about drone strikes to like walking through New York to all kinds of stuff, and it, and it wasn't working. Um, and then uh, one day I was, I was sitting in the library, in the NYU library, and I was sitting right next to one of those large printers that was, someone was like printing out a ton of stuff. And I started thinking about how weird that was. And I started thinking like, what if, I, what if the printer was talking to me? And then I had this amazing idea, which I still think is brilliant, which is that I wanted to have a printer just be one character, and then another printer be another character. And I was going to do a Harold Pinter play, um, where the two printers would just read different like lines to each other. Um, and no one likes this idea. Uh, but uh, I, I talked to Crowley, the, the co-founder um, of the company, about it. And I said, I think I'm really interested in doing an office play. I think I'm interested in, like, can I make a show that happens in an office. Um, and he said, you know what, I think there's something there. Um, and so what we ended up with is this, um, a, a show that happened in an office that told a story through the tools of an office. Um, and it took us about two years to really figure the whole thing out. It went through a bunch of different versions. The first time we did it, um, was in Dixon Place. When was that? Is that the uh, summer of 2014? Yeah, at Dixon Place. And and it was really just sort of Asa and I.
building, I mean, we built a, a cubicle out of foam core walls, um, and we were in like an ugly sort of basement dance studio. And then each time that we've done a sort of developmental residency, we sort of worked on both our technology underneath it, but also the built environment of it. As you can tell, like we get better and better at figuring out how to tell that particular story using like cubicle walls and using the stuff that people had in an actual office. Um, to the point where when we did it here at Lincoln Center in the room that is literally right behind this wall, um, we uh, brought on Sarah Walsh, who's our the company's sort of resident scenic designer, who helped us build a fake wall um, that sort of sealed off part of the room. Uh, at the end of the talk, if you guys want to like walk back there, you should definitely like see the room and see what we did. No vestige of our installation. <laughs> uh, no, we cleaned up really well. Uh, but uh, we really sort of tried to transform that room totally into uh, what felt like a full-on built, what felt like a windowless, tiny office that didn't feel out of place um, in this building at all. But to make all of that work, it took, a, it took us a long time to figure out a very, very complicated back end to sort of drive the whole experience. This is what it looked like when we were installed in Lincoln Center and hidden behind the wall while audiences were sort of running through the piece. Um, and uh, I'll sort of walk you through the, the technology stack right now, but these were all of the sort of uh, major components of the piece. Of the first version. Oh, yeah. We then complicated it. Yeah, we got, we got real complicated. So um, what my major contribution to the piece was a piece of software that I wrote called Show Mailer, which handled all of the emails in the show. Um, it was a, I wrote it in Ruby, and then I used the Web Frameworks Rails to sort of turn it into a web app that uh, allowed the show operator to send emails from every different character in the show at a mouse click, um, and to sort of help us manage the, the like, pretty much what is an unending stream of emails from the second that the audience sits down in the chair. Um, to be able to do that from just a simple mouse click. And that, uh, that email engine was driven by AppleScript from a master QLab list. And that QLab list um, also sent commands to Philips Hue light bulbs to change the color in the room and sent uh, printouts to a printer uh, from a number of different sources and played back sound effects both in the main room and from a speaker behind our fake bookshelf as if it was heard through the hall in the next cubicle. Uh, and we also had a telephone that was powered by another computer that people could interact with. Um, the phone is something that I built. It started off as a simple delivery engine for voicemails from other coworkers. Um, but I realized the potential for much more interactivity. Um, so I wrote some code in QLab to simulate an Office PDX extension. They could record their name into a new voicemail and navigate through telephone menus. Uh, and I got a little phone body and mounted a number pad behind it with an Arduino inside. And at the end of the day, that was the telephone that they could work with. Most people actually believe that. Um, uh, so that's the back, the technical back end of Show. Yeah, oh, I should say also as part of our te technical backend, we also um, made sure that we could watch the user's desktop. So we screen shared them so we could see what they were clicking around on their desktop, as well as we hid a GoPro in the ceiling so that if they moved around in the room, um, we could kind of follow them that way and respond to things that they, all of those incredibly weird things that people would do in an office when they thought they were alone. Um, so. Uh, that's the sort of like tech part of the stuff, uh, or out of this talk. Um, what we haven't told you about is the experience of the story. Um, because we sort of built all of this technology and then kind of didn't know what to do with it. And it's really um, Michael Yates Crowley's uh, contribution to this piece that uh, helped us sort of figure out how to turn the technology into a real experience. Um, and the first thing that he sort of came to the table with was uh, 
looking at um, actuarial companies and insurance companies, and also then treating the audience like a temp. And that was a, a really sort of helpful uh, solution to a problem that we had of like, oh, do we have to invent a character backstory for the audience? But if everyone treated them like a temp, well, okay, your first day is their first day. Um, and that, that allowed us to sort of like uh, give you an experience that you knew what you were supposed to do and everyone else knew who you were, but without having to be like, and you've been working at this company for 15 years and you feel this way about this, you know, thing. Uh, the other thing that he did is he wrote, I think like 50, 70, 100 emails um, for all the different characters in the show and the voicemails and the stuff that happened through the printer um, and really took the time to create very vivid characters using only emails. Um, and that and, was a- And tiny stock headshots. Yeah, and that, that was a thing that uh, really sort of became important for us is to how to denote character when your experience of these people only is through a voice on the end of a phone or an email that you receive. Um, and then the last sort of thing that we had to figure out with the story is what you actually do. Um, because we, we had all of that stuff, but we sort of needed something to then carry people through the piece. Um, and the, this really kind of became the core of the experience. So we, uh, we've narrated you through, okay, you, you came into this room, you sat down at the desk, you sort of understood where you were, but the, the thing that sort of, and I think like the, the special part of the show um, was the sort of narrative experience that happened in Microsoft Excel. Oh. Um, <laughs> and, and that's really the, the core of the show is in Microsoft Excel. Um, we, we called this uh, for a while a, a, a first person spreadsheet. <laughs> Um, so what this is, is uh, you would sit down at the desk, you get a bunch of emails from characters who acted like your boss, and they'd tell you to do things. And after a couple sort of intro exercises of like, oh, can you attach a file to an email, you arrived at this part where they asked you to update client records. Um, and all you had to do is sort of basic data entry type stuff, is change people's status um, in that yellow column from active to deceased. And this is a real thing that real actuarial people have to do. Um, and in our version, this thing happened though, each time that you change someone's status from active to deceased, um, the lights in the room would slowly dim and this quiet music would start playing and your printer would turn on and it would print out a picture of that person's face so that your experience of uh, looking, uh, of, of experiencing people who were just like lines in a database suddenly became really complicated where you're, you all of a sudden realized, oh no, they weren't just, you know, another row in a column, it's a real person. Because not only would you see their face, there would be a description of a piece of text from a, a, where you would sort of catch a moment in their lives that was really personal, um, that really humanized them in some way. Uh, and, and, that, and then you would read that, and that the second that you put down that piece of paper, the lights would return to normal, um, and everything would go back to being the same. And then you'd, do it, you'd like click again on deceased, and then the lights would change, your printer would turn off. And so it kept happening to you over and over throughout the show. Um, and uh, eventually, the sort of like next level of the show, or the next phase of the show, is you had to start calculating out people's life expectancies. And um, these were actually real numbers um, that were true for um, how long people would live. And then we sort of trick you into calculating your own life expectancy. So that's a number you have to live with. And the end of the piece, the end of the show, 
is that you find out that the woman whose desk that you've been sitting at for the entire experience, who you've kind of gotten to know because she's left you voicemails, you've sort of been digging around at her desk, you see like pictures of her nephew um, on the desk, that person you find out has also been fired as well. So that, um, and that you're asked to take her place. So we were hoping that by the end of the piece, it would be a sort of meditation on how much time you have left on this world and sort of the transient nature of life and um, are we all just sort of cogs in the wheel and uh, how people kind of get replaced in many different ways and yeah, so it was like a real upper of a show. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot to pack into 45 minutes of Excel updates. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's the show. Uh, what we're going to talk about now is what we figured out in doing the show, because it took us two years to build, and there were a whole bunch of like sort of uh, parts that didn't work or, or dead ends that we got stuck in, and I figured uh, in this kind of situation you all would be interested in like stuff that we learned that you shouldn't waste your time like, <laughs> messing up on. Um, Okay, the first and most important part was the narrative arc of it. Um, we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, what are the events of this, and how do we set them up in a way that people experience the story in a way that is satisfying, that, set, that sort of primes you for things. Um, and it, it got more and more complicated each time we did it. And um, moreover, we started adding in sort of different narrative branches that depending on how well you did certain tasks, you would get a different experience. Um, and that if you, there's even like a sort of, and we'll talk about this later, but even a moral choice that you're presented with that also sort of leads you down different story paths. Uh, the, okay. the other part of this uh, that we spent a lot of time figuring out is like, how do you create characters or how do you create emotional investment in people that you don't necessarily, like, that aren't an actor right in front of you acting their heart out, but instead looking at the peculiarities of text, looking at specific vocal patterns or, or stuff in the voicemails that allowed audiences to understand who these people were um, as they, as they sort of went through the experience. I think we went through three or four different um, voiceover or voicemail recording sessions with our main cast um, and each time we had to really sort of uh, direct them to, to create specific characters that people could instantly recognize. Um, and then we also spent a lot of time looking at, um, at making sure that the audience understood why people were behaving in certain ways. Um, if part of the thing and because it's a weird show, because it's for one person, um, it's a lonely experience for a person in a cubicle. We had to make sure that people would get the story and understand where and why their bosses were behaving in certain ways, and that they understood um, their the characters' motivations as well. And then the last sort of like major thing that we had to figure out was this issue of choice. And um, unlike a normal piece of theater where the actors stand on stage and they sort of feed forward to the audience for the entire time, this was different because we reacted to what the audience did to us. So uh, our shows, the running time varied um, between 25 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes, mm -hmm. depending on how well the temp did the show or how hard it was for them to get through certain Excel tasks. Um, and I think that was actually a sort of important part, that it was a reactive show rather than a sort of feed-forward show. Um, because it allowed people to feel like this was their world and their, have a, a sense of agency with the show. Um, and sort of along with that, we also became and this sort of came on later in the process of um, presenting a moral choice to the audience. And uh, the, the thing that we'll talk about right now is that at the end, or close to the end of the show, you're presented with your, uh, the boss character has been sending you 
or you've been receiving, I should say, sensitive things that maybe you shouldn't have. And um, towards the end of the show, you're asked to shred all of those documents. And having, and then as soon as you get that email, you're also then given a voicemail from another character telling you, don't shred those documents. And so to see how people reacted to that, or um, as we were like running the show a couple times, trying to catch them in the act of shredding, <laughs> Um, and then watch them on the monitor go, oh no, oh no, I shredded them. Try to pull the papers out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, became interesting and important to us to sort of like see how people uh, reacted to this thing. I mean, the whole thing is, it's half a piece of theater and half a like psychological experiment, I think. Along those lines, uh, people interacted with it in very, very different ways. Yeah. Uh, we presented them a script of sorts with items in, in order that we expected them to, to experience them in that order. But people would go off the reservation often, send emails that we didn't have canned responses to, send some very strange emails sometimes. Um, so in addition to the script, essentially, that was inside the computers, we had on our phones um, all of the different people's email addresses so we could respond back to any unanticipated emails in character and keep the story going okay. and give them little uh, hints and tips if they were lost. They didn't know how to, for example, right-click a PC mouse. <laughs> we would jump on as the IT person and let them know about that. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of the broad sort of overview of, um, of the things, and just to sort of run through this, because I know there's a lot, um, the stuff that we figured out is that ordering the events matters a lot, um, and that uh, for us, what became interesting was inverting that audience relationship, if you're making an interactive piece, as opposed to trying to tell an audience how to feel or what to do, letting them do stuff, and then building in ways to interact with them after they've made a certain choice. You know, we wanted to make sure that everybody had sort of an equivalent experience, even if it wasn't an exactly equal experience, that the different, uh, the branches of the different choices wouldn't completely change the direction to take it out of our control. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing that was weirdly important was people being alone in the room and feeling alone in the room. We had a couple sort of disastrous um, experiences in, Maryland where we let people do the show together or in a small group and it, the show didn't work because they ended up like arguing with each other about how to respond to emails or criticizing each other's like Excel abilities and that uh, there's something about being alone about uh, of it being a show that you read and listen to as opposed to watch uh, that sort of ignited people's imaginations and allowed them to invest more in the characters and invest more in the experience of it than if they were sort of in an audience just watching. We've also tried to uh, do versions where you just watch someone else do the show and that doesn't work because you're just watching someone click. Um, it's really about being in the room, being in, present within that cubicle that uh, makes, I, I don't know, it, 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 it works that way. It doesn't work the other way. Um, and then the last sort of like major point is, is to be prepared for, if, if you're making something interactive, and we had to learn this painfully a number of times, that people will do things that you had no idea that they would ever do. Um, you or, give them a sandbox, they're gonna play. Yeah, and, and being able to set up that sandbox in a way that they still felt safe and that they felt like they could do what they wanted to, but also um, to be able to guide them through the way that they, through the story and what you wanted them to get to.